questions you'll see on your bar it says Q&A or it also says um, more you can click on the chat and put your questions there um, I might have a few questions as we go throughout the session today and I'll have a chance to give feedback to your questions so feel free to ask questions as we go but this is a z-link to the, the website information oops let me see there's one put, put a chat in right now let's see what they said Hi, Dave, we oh, can here. see. Here's the link. She did the link. All right. So she also put the link in the chat box just now. So you can find that as you will. Yeah, we so like can said, see slide 63 and not the first slide. Oh, you can. Huh? So I, I did change that to it. Okay. Let's see. Stop share. Zoom share. How would that be? Slideshow from beginning. Let's just get rid of this one. All right, I'll try over again. I'll start. Thanks for telling. I was wondering because it came out twice, and I was like, "That's kind of weird." On our end, open it up. no longer see your slides. We can just see you. Correct. I am going to open it up again because it just, uh, for a reason, had two of them set up there. Well, those things happen. All right. We are working on it here, so it should. Why am I not seeing it? Share screen. There we go. Finally pulled up in that box where I want it. All right, here we go. Sorry for the delay. All right, this is a slide I supposed to, I had on my screen all the time. See, that was what I did earlier. So sorry for that. So here's the Z-Link that I was talking about uh, for getting to the handout as well. Again, earlier I said, I'm, this is Dave, I'm Dave Bow. I'm out of Southwest Minnesota, out of the Warrington office. Um, this is my email address and there's my cell phone number and Amber sent her email and phone number in the email link earlier this morning. So um, you're welcome to talk to us outside the seminar. I get at least three questions a year around about rent and so you can send me a, an email or send me a question on my cell phone and I'll get back to you when we can. But we're going to start with a question for you. We're here to talk about what's it's a fair rent for 2021. So what do you think is a fair rent? What's your rate on your property? What do you think you're going to, is a fair number to you? Because we're going to hopefully give you information to make you decide if that's a good number or not this morning. So just take a moment. If you did print off the handout inside the front cover, are these questions I'm going to ask you in the order. So the first question on that, on the inside the front cover, it says, what do you think is a fair rate for your property? Write that down. All right. So here's our objective this morning. Um, we're going to go through and talk about rental rate trends. I'm going to talk about corn and soybean budgets for 2021. Um, those two crops, I know you're in, you're in sugar beet country up there. Most of Southern Minnesota does not have those competing crops for the bid of land rent, but we're going to talk about that as well. But corn and soybeans really do run the rents in Southern Minnesota, and I'll show you a slide a bit later that talks about that. I'm going to use Finman data today. Um, the farmers who are part of the adult farm management program in the Minsk system and extension put their data with the records from those associations, put their data in this Finman database. It's a great source of data. You can look at McLeod County and other counties around, and you can find uh, comparing budgets. Most time today, I'm going to look at Southern Minnesota. There's roughly 1,200 farms in the Southern, from St. Cloud East and West to Wisconsin and South Dakota, South to Iowa. There's 1,200 farms that are in there over a long period of time. I've got since the 70s, following that average numbers. You can look, I said, you can look at McLeod County. Um, you can look at other areas of the state as well. So it's a great, a great source of data. I want to look at land values. Again, there's lots of information out there about land values, and both farmers and landlords want to know about that. So I've got some sources for you today. We have three worksheets we're going to share with you this morning, one for the landlord to fill out, one for the tenant to fill out, and one for the farmers in the group to fill out. It's called a simple price worksheet. So I have four marketing groups that meet monthly, and we do this once a year to figure out our break, like our break even prices, and, and uh, Amber working with through those three worksheets. I'm also going to talk about incorporating flexible rents. Um, I've been doing these workshops for about 15 years, and I'd say we had less than 10% of them were doing those back then. It's increasing. I'd say it's over 20% today, which is good. And the reason why I like them is because it shares the risk and reward between the farmer and the landlord. I'm going to end up with talking about negotiations between the two parties. 
We're going to start at historical rental rate information. Um, this is from our extension website. You can find our ag, ag business management team's information here. You go to our website, select learn, uh, learn about managing a farm, and you'll find lots of information. And even these slides, that's somewhat different, but there's a lot of information on there. You'll find information there. We're going to start with talking about this handout. It's in your materials as well, but it's a four page handout that's online. Extension has gone away from PDF files because they want everything to be visible on your cell phones today. So um, PDFs don't really show up that well. I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. I'm used to all these numbers on a table that overwhelm me with all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. So this, this, this four page document you can find online. I have two bosses on campus right now. They work in the Center for Farm Management Management. That's their website. And they still put this document as a PDF file. So once a year, we update this database. So you'll find this in July next year, you'll find 2020 rental rates from the, from the adult farm management program. Right, down, right now it goes to 2019. But again, you can go there and look at this document and we're gonna show you some of it this morning in this presentation. So again, if you follow along, sometimes when Amherst talking, she includes the title page, sometimes I don't. So minor number without the title page. So I'm on page two and on, they're by sections. So on the bottom of page two, you'll find central Minnesota. These counties are listed. So you're, we're based inside of Hutchinson. So we're gonna go to McLeod County and we're gonna say, here's the 2015, 16, 17, 18. Those are the average rents of the farmers who are part of the Delphi Management Program off their records. Those are the average rents that have been paid. And you see four columns of 2019. Those four columns, the first one is the average rent in 2019. So you can see the trend, it went down $10 an acre, supposedly from 18 to 19. It's pretty well, it's a, it's a ever changing database. So some farmers retire, new farms come in. So it's not always the same farmer, but it's pretty consistent with the group. So there's always a lot of carryover from year to year. Then you see the, the median. So of all the farms that were listed for rents in 2019, they land up lowest to highest. The very middle rent in that database was 199. So half the rents were at 199 or higher and half the rents were at 199 or more. That was below, that was the very middle rent. Then you see a column called the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile. Um, those figures basically um, take the average of the bottom 10% of those line of rents. So it says 117, that was the average of those bottom 10%. And there's some lower than that, but that was the average. And the top 10% averaged 239. So again, there were higher rents than that, but that was the average for the top 10% of the rents. So it gives you the average for the whole group, the very middle rent, and then the average for the bottom 10% and the average for the top 10%. Then you see another column says 2020 NAS data. NAS stands for Ash National Ag Statistics Service. And they started publishing county rents in 2008. They skipped a few years, like they skipped 17, or they skipped 18, but they did put, do it in 19 and 20. So this is another source of data. These, these FIMDA data come off their farmer's records, the Delphine Manager Program. This is done by a survey. So USDA is saying the average rents in 2020 was 202, and that compares pretty closely to the FIMDA data from the year before of 201. So pretty close data, but they're not always that close. There's $24 difference, there's $8 difference. But there, there's a lot of difference here in, in Morrison. You know, they're very bit, but there's something data there. And the good news about this one, so you see like Sherburne County, if you're from there, there are probably farmers in the Dolphin Major Program, but just not enough place data. At least you have a source of numbers for rent there if you had land in Sherburne County. And there's a blank line there for you to add your own numbers in. So again, the whole state's in the handout um, and it's online as well, so you can find these numbers. This is on the four page handout you can find online and regionally, this shows you some, some trends. So we're in central Minnesota today, virtually in, in, in Hutchinson today. And for the last five years in the Delphi Management Program, the rents have gone down cumulatively 8.4% over that five year period. And for the last year from 18 to 19, the rents went down 2.3%. So that gives you some trends for central Minnesota, what's happening to rental rates. But when Amber and I talk about the whole state and doing rental rates, we use the statewide numbers. So down below here, you can see for the five, five year period, it went down seven and a half, but for the last year, they only went down 0.4%. That means less than one half percent down. So in general, they didn't change much from 18 to 19. And you're going to find some USDA numbers a little bit later. This morning we're going to talk about they didn't change at all from 19 to 20 for the state. So in general, when we forecast rents right now, we always use these two databases for trends. And right now, that trend will be zero, where you know very little down decline. For, so we, we, you'll see some numbers for 21 estimates that have no change from from 20. So we're going to start with some more questions for you. And we're gonna start with what do you think it costs to produce one acre of corn and one acre of soybeans? What's your estimate? Total, total cost per acre includes your rent. So we're talking 
you know, a couple hundred dollars more. So put that number down in, in corn and put that number down in soybeans and just fill in the blanks. We're in, we're in corn and soybean number. I know you're a sugar beet up there, but we're going to talk about corn and soybeans because in general, in this region where these 12 farms are, corn and soybeans really do control the rental rates. I mean, we could look at, we'll talk about sugar beet impact, but we'll, we'll show you these numbers in general. We're going to start with talking about a corn budget for 2021. Again, we're going to use that Finman database and we're going to show you that 1200 farms in Minnesota, but you can look at McLeod County if you like. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my cohort today, Amber, and she's going to uh, talk you through these budgets. Take it away. Thanks, Dave. So, yep, we're going to talk through that 2021 corn budget. If for some reason you did want to see a soybean, or excuse me, a sugar beet budget, you can go and look at, we provided today, the Southern Minnesota um, budgets, but we do have one for Northwest Minnesota that does include some information on sugar beets as well. But we're just going to talk about corn and soybeans here. Next slide. Thank you. So if you're looking at these budgets on the handout, the first part of the budget just gives us an idea of, um, in that first column, you'll see that they have all the different variables. The next one over shows us the range. So that's the highest and the lowest for each variable that we've seen in the last 10 years. So for this first uh, column, you'll see that we have yield per acre. At the highest, it was 210 bushels for corn. In the lowest year, it was 157 bushels. That next one over, that shows us what's the average in from the last 10 years. And then we provide the 2019 actual yields that we saw, the trends for 2020 and 2021. And lastly, that very last column is forecasted. What do we think going into 2021? So if we're just looking at this top part of the corn budget for 2021, you know, they're predict, they're forecasting a yield of 190 bushels per acre, a value or a, a price of $3.50. So if we're looking at that, that's actually lower than what we saw in 2019 for actuals. And that's on the lower end of that range from 2010 to 2019. And so using that knowledge, our total production return per acre would be our yield times our price. So 665, that would put us below what we saw last year and on the lower end of that range value. I just want to point one thing out here, that miscellaneous income per acre, you'll see that we have a zero forecasted for 2021. And part of that is if we have higher yields, we're less likely to get things like our county payments, PLC payments, so crop insurance, and then also, Dave will talk a little bit later about MFP, Market Facilitation Program. And that was factored into previous years, but won't be factored into this 21 forecasted uh, miscellaneous income. Next slide. Okay, moving along, we have direct expenses here. Um, as you're going through, you can see how direct expenses what that average has looked like over the last 10 years. You can see what we're forecasting in to 2021. Direct expenses stay pretty consistent over time. The one I wanna point out here is highlighted in yellow, and that is our land rent number. Um, and so forecasted into 2021 is $205 per acre. You know, and that looks very similar to what we saw if you look at the 2019 actual numbers. And as we continue through talking about this, um, we'll give you a little bit more of an idea of how you can figure out what an appropriate land rent value is for you. But just something to show that 205 forecasted for 21 looks pretty close to what we saw in 2019 at $208 um, and is just a little bit below that 10 year average that we saw um, at $211. But if you go all the way down to those last two rows that we have here, total direct expense per acre forecasted for 21, $639. Um, that would put us at what we saw in 2019. Um, so very close to those numbers last year. And then that return over direct expense per acre, this is taking that estimated gross income and subtracting those direct expenses from it. And if we're looking at the forecasted 2021 numbers, they're a little bit lower than what we've seen. $26 would put us below that 10-year low uh, range. 
So something good to note when you're creating budgets for your farm. Next slide. This slide, we're gonna look at overhead expenses. Overhead expenses don't change a lot year to year. If you look at what we're forecasting for 2021, $48 in overhead expenses, that matches with what we saw in 2019 at $48. That's, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm looking at the wrong line there. I'm looking at machine and building depreciation. My apologies, sometimes the numbers are small on the screen. Uh, we're looking at $96 for total overhead expense per acre. That matches very close to what we saw in 2019 at $95. So a total for our overhead and our direct expenses, about $735 for our forecast for 2021. That looks very similar to what we saw in 2019. But then we have to factor in, what will our net return per acre be? So when we take that estimated gross income and we subtract our direct expenses and our total expenses, you know, we're looking at a loss of $70 per acre forecasted into 2021. And that would be lower than what we've seen in that 10 year range. That 10 year range, we've seen a loss of about $57. Um, so that would put us even lower than that. So something really important to think about as we're looking into budgets for 2021. Next slide. Okay, so then this last part of our corn budget, here we talk about labor and management charges. We show government payment charges. This uh, forecasted $8 per acre we'll use in a later example. Um, but the one thing I really wanna point out here is what's highlighted in yellow. And that's that $4.10. So what this cost of production portion of the budget is telling us is it's saying in order to hit your break even, and for this yellow, we're talking with government payments, with additional income. Um, in order to hit that, you need to get a price of $4.10 um, in order to make that break even. And hopefully get a price that's even a little bit higher than that $4.10 so that we're making some income. Dave, would you like to add something in? The only thing I want to talk about was the error that I had. And your handouts might have an error here, this negative 28. It might say negative 88, so that first eight should be a two. I just, and I don't know if that was updated in your version we attached, I don't think it probably was, because we just kicked, caught that a while back, so last week. So I just want to tell you that um, there's one change in that handout. On the trend for 2020, it says 88, a negative 88, 23, it should be 28, 23. That's all I wanted to add, sorry to interrupt. Yep. No, you're great, thank you. That's uh, good to note. So if, you're, if you printed it out, you can change it there. If you're looking at it virtually, just remember that we have that slight update. Um, so $4.10, that is according to what we're forecasting, what you need to get in order to hit that break even. And we'll talk a little bit later about how you can calculate for your specific farm, what that break even price needs to be. Next slide. Great, now we're gonna go to the soybean budgets and talk through those. Next slide. These are also numbers that Dave has collected for Southern Minnesota through FinBen. He's done a great job because you could look at pages and pages of spreadsheets and instead we've just put it into one very simple budget for you um, that gives you an idea of what that trend has looked like over time again, gives you an idea of what the average over the last 10 years has been and what we're forecasting into 2021. So yields 52 bushels per acre, uh, that it falls right in line with the 10-year average that we've seen for soybean yields. Uh, a value or a price of $9 is what's forecasted. That's higher than what we would have seen in 2019, a little lower than that 10-year average, um, but higher than prices we saw last year. So when we multiply our yields times our price, we get 468 for a total product return per acre. That would be higher than what we saw in 2019. But again, no miscellaneous income expected for 2021. So that would give you that gross return forecasting into 2021 of $468, um, which is lower than what we've seen in the last 10 years. If you look at that range value, the lowest we've seen is 474. So if we do get 468, that would put us on the lower end. Next slide. Direct expenses, these look uh, very similar to what we saw in the previous example. 
Uh, total direct expenses per acre of $436. So when we subtract that gross income uh, and we take away our direct expenses, that would leave us for 2021 with a forecasted net return of $32 uh, per acre. So that also puts us below the lowest of that 10 year range that we've seen, almost half of what we've seen at the lowest end. Um, so really important to think through that as you're creating these budgets. Next slide. Here we have overhead expenses. Um, overhead expenses don't change a lot year to year. You see total overhead expenses for 2021, $66. That's very similar to what we've seen with that 10 year average and that 2019 uh, actual overhead expenses. So for our total direct and total overhead expenses, about $502. And when we subtract that from our gross income, that would leave us for 2021 with a loss of $34 per acre. Um, so that loss of $34 per acre would be lower than what we've seen in 2010 and, or from 2010 to 2019. Next slide. So how do we avoid that loss of $34 per acre? Well, part of what we need to figure out is, you know, what is that price that we need to hit in order to make our break even? So up at the top, we have information about net return with labor and management, government payments. As you can see, they're predicting some uh, government payments, but not a lot, about $6 per acre, which would be close to what we saw in 2019. And then this cost of production portion of the budget, we're saying, what is that price that you need to hit in order to make your break even? And for 2021, including government payments, including any other income that you might have per acre, that's $10.21. So that's about the price that you would need to be getting in order to hit that break even and to avoid losing money on your soybean acres. And hopefully getting a little bit above that $10.21 too. Next slide. All right, thanks Amber. Um, so we talked a lot about prices and I used $9 and three fifty those budgets. And right now the, the bean price is well above $9 and even next year's price. But the corn price is pretty accurate 2020, but we're talking about 20 crop here. We've had a very, very wide variation in prices this last year and, and they're increasing as we speak. Um, so what do you think we should use for a price estimate for last year, 2020? Um, just put a number down we think we should use in these budgets for this, this past year. Um, is it just an estimate for corn and soybeans? If you go to your handout again, I've got a whole long list of prices. These are Worthington, Minnesota cash prices. It's actually New Vision Co-op. My predecessor, Erlen Wienus, had done this in the 70s. So I've got this database going back to 1974. It's a long history of prices. These are the cash prices. So you can see in 2019, that was a high price during the year, $4.37. The, or the whole year average was $3.73. The low up price during the year of 2019 was $3.35. Same for beans, the high was 889, the average is 814, and the low is 740. So those will give you some things, some prices to think about where we're going to go in 2020 and 2021. If you look at the bottom of the, of the slide on your handout, it's got the whole year period from 74 or 75 through 2019. But here I've got a 10-year average. Those are pretty good numbers down there, that 10-year average slide on that slide. <clears throat> $5.29 for high, $4.39 for the average, and so on, and beans. Similar numbers. But if you look at the five years, go up and look at 19 through 15, you can see those numbers are near, aren't near as high as those 10 year averages, even. So we've lowered the prices in the last five years, even compared to the last 10 years. Because in the last 10 years, we had some $17 beans at, for highs. We had $13 beans for an average almost. And over here on, on corn, we had two years above or three years above $7. So what do you use for a price in 2020? We'll talk more about that. So here's the current prices. Um, this is at Hutch Elevator. Green ele uh, anyway, it's the price this morning. I went online, looked at it this morning. So there's your cash price for corn for right out of the field today, or if you're still, there's still some corn out there. Most of it's harvested, but that's the current cash basis. And this is the cash price. So you take the futures price, and you get this cash price for corn today. Uh, Amber and I were on, the, on one of these on Friday, and the price was over $4. So this basis number really changes a lot as you go around the state. So right now, that's not a very good basis for for the whole state, but it's what your basis today in Hutchinson. 
Then you go down here to 421 and you see the basis gets wider. We got a, a hand raise there, 65 under. So the current cash price for next year, which you're using your budget for, tw for 21, when you use 350, it's only 341. So we got a hand raise. So Arlen, do you want to put a question out there for us in the chat box? And you, you are as we speak. I think, let's see, chat. What? Um. So the question we have from um, online was, if the farmer needs 410 to break even and the price for next fall is 341, how does that price impact rents? Well, it'll impact it if that 410 ever gets reached during the year. This is the price today, and that's the price we have at the moment. But what happens if the price goes to $5? We can't say it's not going to. What happens if the price goes to $3? We did under $3, we did this last year. So that, that variable price really does have a big impact on the farmer's profitability. And uh, so we have to think about um, how do we do it? Uh, it, rent, it doesn't, in the long run, it will have an impact on rents. Unfortunately, it's not impacted right away because what I'll tell you is rents are slow to go up in the good times and they're slow to go down in the poor times. So prices do have an impact, but it's not immediate. So right now, those are the budgets. We're doing the budgets kind of prepared to show you where we sit today and how it looks in the future. Okay. Thanks for the questions. So that's the corn situation. Here's the soybeans. So again, this is a bean price right now in Hutchinson is a 72 cent base. $10 and cents is a cash price. And like I said, it varies a lot. Um, next Monday, I'm gonna be in Mankato. I was looking at their prices this morning and they're well over $11 for the basis. They got like a 20 cent basis. So that's a big difference. And new crop bed is 90 cents under is, is, is a basis around the state we've had for the last several years. So 942, so we use $9 for, for the current price. Again, I those budgets. I was kind of looking forward to what it might be for the whole year of 2021. And right now, maybe I use 950 because we're at 942. But again, um, we're just giving you a, a budget to work with. Okay. So it gives you the current outlook. So how do we look at 2020 numbers? Well, there's lots of variables. The first one is yields. And they have varied a lot across the state. I know we're, we're talking about, I think your crops in your area were pretty good. We had much better than 19. We had uses for planting. We got the cropping on time. We had pretty good moisture throughout the summer until the end of the summer. It might have dried out in certain parts of the state. So that really did have impact yields, especially down here in Southwest Minnesota. We had some poor yields. We also had some wind events that hurt some of the areas of Minnesota. So I've heard yields of corn vary from 120 bushel corn to over 270. But what's the average? I, around here, I think the average is under 200 bushels. So again, you, you hear all the good numbers, but you don't hear the bad numbers. But the yields are really variable. Beans, I've heard 30 to 70 bushels, big, very, big range. Government payments. Amber has talked about your government payments as we went through the 2020 budget. Um, farmers received five, could have received five different forms of payments this last year in 2020. And they, I'll talk about those later. So they did really have impact this year. And then prices. Well, we're gonna talk more about prices, but 2020, uh, April, May, June, July, we were under $3 corn down here for most of the year for 2020 corn, and we we're under $9 beans. The, the rise in prices didn't really happen until uh, second week of August for both corn and beans. So a lot of my farmers in my marketing groups have, they try to sell a lot of their crops before July 1st, especially what they can't hold in storage on the farm. So again, um, what, what do they get for a price this year? Really variable. So I've got a question for everybody in the audience again. What do you think the farmer's profit's gonna be in 2020 on rented corn ground per acre? And the same thing for 2020 beans. Just write your estimate down. What do you think they're gonna make on this year's crop? I've got a table here, just gives you some overview. And again, it's just some examples. So I'm gonna walk through some examples here. Um, a year ago when we did these workshops, the, the worksheets that Amherst walked through, we used $743 expense corn and $483 for soybeans without any labor cost. When I put the slide together, I'm, I used yield of 200 bushel corn and 55 bushel soybeans. And when I did the same slide, the price rate at the time was 3, 380 for cash corn and 990 for cash beans. So those are the, that was the income. And there was the expenses. So you had $17 profit on corn and 61.50 profit on soybeans for an average of 39.25. Again, we didn't get soy, we haven't talked about sugar yet, but that's what the corn and soybean outlook was. Government payments. In my marketing groups, I'll show what those are a little bit, but that the range of payments per farmer per acre 
range from $11 per acre to $100 per acre. Again, a big variable, kind of what the programs they were signed up, how they did the 19 crop, there's a lot of different variables there. So the $39 does not include that, that's probably before government payments. If I use higher yields, which you might have had farmers in your area getting 220 and 65 bushel soybeans, um, the profit would increase to an average of 126.75, again, without government payments. If I use lower prices, which again, um, a lot of farmers might have sold their crop earlier before the price happened, and might average 330 and 850. If those were the cases for their prices, at 200 bushel corn and 55 bushel beans, they would not make any money. But if they got the higher 220 and 65, they'd make 26.25. But again, all those examples, I did not include that government payments because it's really a variable too amongst the farmers what they're actually going to get. So those government payments, what were they? Well, the first we always talk about here about is the farm bill. The farm bill, farmers sign up for each year, or actually they sign up for two years and then first time. And the farm bill right now is called has two programs called the ARC County Payment Program and the Price Loss Coverage. The ARC County uses county yields and the marketing average prices to figure out the yields and compare if the county yields were lower than the historic and it gives them a payment. And the price loss coverage takes the marketing average price and compares that to their benchmark price or their target prices. And if it's lower than that, they get a payment. So in 2019, down here in Southwest Minnesota, we had preventive plant, 30 acre, 3 percent of our acres didn't get planted in some of our counties down here. So our, our market, our government farm bill payments for our county, we've got maximum payments in some of the counties down here. But that varied across the state. A lot of counties did not get any payments. And then soybeans, we, we got a max payment as well, but a lot of counties got less than the soybeans. Um, and if the price loss coverage, if you would have taken that uh, program, you would have got nothing for soybeans across the state, but you would have got 12 cents a bushel for, for corn if you signed up for that. But again, a majority of farmers signed up for the Ark County. There was also something called WIP payments in 2018, 2019. In order to be eligible for that, oh, I, I skipped the CARES Act again. I skipped that CARES Act. The CARES Act came out basically because of uh, the, the negotiations Trump was doing with China caused the prices to be tanked where we had this under $3 corn and under $9 beans. So the CARES Act came out and, and gave some funding to farmers to help with those losses, the lower prices. Very, very helpful to farmers. So that came out too. And then the WIP payments, um, they're like a, crop in, a supplemental crop insurance. So if you were in a county that had the disaster declaration or next to a county with a disaster declaration in 2018 or 19, and you had a loss on your farm. Um, this would be a high little, it would take away your crop insurance, but give you additional payments. What crop insurance didn't cover enough of the crop. So you would have got additional payments if you're eligible. Another program was out there called the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program. This is for your employees to help pay them in the, in the poor times. You're not making money and also for their wages themselves. Um, and it started out as a loan program but it's, it's really going to turn into a, a grant program if they can, if they prove they use it properly, like the program requested. So again, that's another form of income. And then this just recently now they've came up with the CARES Act too to help farmers. With, they came up kind of before election time, around election time. So there's five sources there. So again, there's a big range of, of who gets those programs, who's eligible for those programs, but it did have an impact on the economics of 2020 crop. Now we're going to spend a little time looking at the historical data. Again, I'm going to use FinBen data um, and look at those variable costs. We, we always, we've talked about averages so far, a lot of averages so far in the talk, and I would argue none of us are average. We're better at some things and, and poor at some things. So now the next couple of slides are going to show you the variation in the data of farmers. Again, it comes from FinBen data. You can pick on that green crop bar. It'll show you corn on cash on the ground. You can pick the red one. Corn will pop up again, but now you see a benchmark report, and that's what a benchmark report looks like with this. Lots of numbers on here. Again, we're numbers people, but this is a puts a lot of numbers on one page. So it's, it's kind of small print. We apologize for that. And you have to look at your hand off if you have it. But there's a lot of columns, a lot of things to talk about, but each row is unique with the columns. So what it shows the first row is yield. And we've got my farm. This is called kind of a benchmark report for the Delphi Farm Management Program. So it compares their farm. Like if I was doing it down here in Southwest Minnesota, I'd see my farm compared to 211 farms in my area. This is the whole state of Minnesota though, to, the, to these other columns. So I'm compare my farm to the whole state, everybody who raised corn. So on my farm, on my farm, I got 185.63 bushels in 2019. The next column is median. So for each row, that's the very middle value. So they line up on yield, the lowest yields to the highest yields, and the very middle yield value was 197. 
So that means half the yields are above 190, at 190, I'm sorry, 179. We're at 179 or higher or lower, or at 179 or lower. That was the very middle uh, yield. You can also see how much it varied. The count is number of farms in each row. So we've got 3,749 farms. If I take 10% of that, what's that? 375 farms. So what it does here, it takes every 10% of the farms in these columns and puts them in the ranking. So from lowest to highest, lowest 10% averaged 211 bushels an acre, roughly. 200, 110, the next 200, or 375 farms averaged 140. And so on to the top 10%, another 375 farms averaged 223 bushels. So a big range, double the bushels from top to bottom. And again, this is the whole state of Minnesota. So we got we got farms with in poor ground where sandy soil is not irrigated. So they're in this database as well. And we do have farms that because of 19 wet spring, they planted corn way too late and didn't get the yields. Um, or, and so that shows up here as well. So it shows the variation. So this, uh, next row is, is value per unit. So it's what the farmers hold their crop for and what was left at the end of the year, they put a value to it. So the sample farm got 378, the median was 370. But the bottom 10% was 325 and the top 10% was 390. So 65 cents from top to bottom is a big difference. So again, um, price has a big impact. You see some cells over in each row that are highlighted in yellow. This is what the benchmark report looks like for the farmer. They get their numbers highlighted where they would fall in each row. If I'm that farmer, I want my highlighted cells to be on the top half, 60% to 100%, because that means I'm doing a, outperforming half the group. My numbers are 10 to 50%, I'm in the bottom half. So I'm, I'm, those are areas maybe I need to work on. So you can see on yield, I'm doing good, and price I was doing good, and total yield and price, I'm doing real good. So um, something to think about there. Then we next row is hedging accounts. Look at the count. Only 133 farms out of 3750 roughly. So very few farms had a hedging account. So now every one of these 10% brackets count only for 13 farms. Our sample farm did have a hedge account. He made $5.42 an acre uh, per acre. The group meeting was 19, but some lost $57 an acre and some made $50 an acre, but only 13 farms in each one of those columns. Next one's crop insurance. Again, different count number. So we've got roughly a little over a third of the farms got crop insurance. 1,300 of them got crop insurance. Sample farm did, the median did. But again, so 10% of 1,300 farms is 130 farms in each one of those columns. Then you see other income, as um, Amber alluded to earlier, this is where the Farm Business Management Program put the market facilitation program payments in 2019. There's government payments separate from the farm bill that are down below under government payments, but this is where they put the um, market facilitation program payments. So again, that was kind of a special program that came out to help with the lower prices. So it shows that the big number and almost every farm got one. You can see the count there. But a few didn't, but not very few. And those are probably the ones that didn't sign up for the farm bill, period. They don't have, some farmers don't have, aren't part of the farm program. So anyway, you see a big range of some only got $35 and some got over $100. So I just kind of like make $1,100 this year I was talking about earlier. So let's go down and look at their, we're talking about land rent. On the, in, on the expenses side, they list the highest expenses first and then the lowest. So again, I want to have lower expenses and better yields. So I want to be on top half for the yields and prices, and I want to be the bottom half for, for expenses. So again, I want to be in these brackets. So you can see the sample farm was in the higher group for seed cost. He was about average, a little bit uh, above, below average for um, fertilizer costs, but he was doing good controlling costs in the other ones. But his rent, uh, again, he was in the bottom third for rent, but you see the rental range we're here to talk about was 266 down to 61. That seemed like a big range. It's, it's not all the same county, it could be, but I would argue that $61, when I go to fully Minnesota, that's the county average rent on dry land, cropland with no irrigation. So again, they're all included in this database, okay? Let's go down to total revenue, total expenses for the farms. Here was a sample farm, there was a median, but 10% of the farms, 375 farms, had a cost breaker to raise one acre corn in 19 of almost $900. And it goes so on declines, we go up to the top end, only had $438 invested for one acre of corn, less than half the cost. So when you're out to talking to individual people between farmers and landlords talking about the economics, boy, there's a lot of variables out there and not everybody's the same. We talk about averages a lot, but again, nobody's average. Then I wanna keep going down the bottom here and um, 
return over labor and management. Our sample farm lost some money. 10% uh, of the farms lost a lot of money, over $200. And oh, I got my move my boxes here. Um, you can see uh, the top end though made 300 or $235. So a big range, big swing. Um, and you see half of them lost money and half of them made money. If you go on the cost of production of labor and management, so they take all their costs divided by uh, their expense, all their costs divided by their actual yields and their other income, they need $3.97 to pay the bills. The median only needs three sixty two, dollars but here the bottom 10% needed $5.44 on the price in their grain to pay their bills. And the cheapest to get by was $2.38, big variance there. So if I, in looking at 2020 budget, use this slide, if I take similar yields and I take similar expenses, this would tell me that at 350 corn, they would make money, they would make money, they would make money, they would make money, but about half of them would make money at 352. And like now I showed you the current price for Hutchinson, it was actually below that, but for 2021 corn. But again, about half the corn would make money looking to a comparison with that slide. So that means the same, same heading, same, same rows. Um, you can see the counts a little bit less because not everybody raises uh, corn or soybeans that have corn. You even have less farms that have hedging accounts in soybeans. If you look at all different costs, they vary quite a bit. But again, if I look at my, the rent's a little less on, on the corn and soybean budgets, the rent's always a little less on soybeans on these, in these numbers. But come down our total cost breaker at 606 for 10% of the soybean producers, down to 239. So again, less than half the cost, top to bottom, just like it was in corn. Look at profitability. Um, the bottom 10% lost 151 and 40% lost money average, but 60% made money, a little better than corn. And top 10% made $213 an acre. So a big variation there as well. And then we come down here to that price. Sample farm got 852. He needed to pay the bills. He got 856. So instead of like he lost money on the corn budget, here he made money, so he has no losses. And but the sample farm did well, but the, the bottom 10% needed $12.77 in 2019, price never got there. So they lost money and guarantee they lost that group lost money, those 10%, 1055 and so on to the top end can make it at $4 and 65 cents. So if I use $9 that we did in our budget, all these groups would make money all the way down to here at 950. So 80% would make money. We're not 1055. So 80% of the money groups would make money uh, on soybeans. So soybeans still look better for going forward to 21 than corn does. So input costs, we just went to the budgets. We looked at these variable costs on these individual farms. So what do you think input costs are gonna do next year in 2021? Are they gonna stay the same? Are they gonna go down? Are they gonna go up? Again, take some time on your own sheet of paper or whatever, just write down you think that what they're gonna do. Choose one of those three. All right. So what direction will they go in 2021? Will they stay the same? Well, in the budgets that Amber went over, you saw corn seed cost was actually going down last several years because for the five years previously, 2019, farmers had lost money on corn on cash on the ground, at least 1,200 farms. So they've been looking for ways to cut their costs a little bit, lower their expenses. So they've been trying to keep their budgets the same or lower each year. So they've been looking for keeping input costs the same. Well, that could be the case in a lot of them. Well, they go down. Well, like seed, they were trying to work them down. Um, they depends on how they're doing economically. But right now, if they see costs to go down, if they bought the latest and greatest uh, stacks and treatments on seed, they'd go up, definitely would go up. But they've been not buying the latest, greatest technology and so they've been going down gradually over time. So again, they could do all three of those with seed alone. Well, they go up. Well, 2019 turned the corner a little bit. Farmers um, actually stopped those losses they had in corn and they've always made money in soybeans. And 2020 will probably even be a better year. Most farmers got better above average yields. And are, if they hadn't sold their crop before second week of August, they're gonna get better prices. So um, there's an opportunity for farmers to have better income along with all the government payments. So when they do well, so do the input suppliers. So there's a, there's a correlation there a little bit for the, when the price, when the farmers are making money, the input costs will go up too. So what are the three biggest factors to the farmer's profitability? The first one is cost. I just went through the other costs, but land rent is about a third of the cost for the corn budget and about 40% of the cost for soybeans. 
So a farmer's going to try to control their costs to the max, which, one, which input are they going to look at the most and negotiate the hardest, the hardest negotiations? It's rent, which we're talking about today. Yields. Again, farmers don't want to cut their inputs if it cuts their yields significantly. So, and this year yields varied a lot, from 120 to 270, from 30 to 70 bushels. So again, a big variable there on yields. And prices. This was last year's numbers, but that was a range of prices 19 through this time of year. And you can see our corn prices actually the low was like 260 this year. So much lower than that 340, 48. And the high has not gotten up 416 yet for cash. And on beans, you can see at 740, that's been there this year for a lot. And now you see our high is up to $11. So that's what it's in 20, but that just shows you the two year comparison. So what's the trend in input costs? Well, for the last 10 years from 2010 through 2019, Corn input costs increased at a rate of less than 1%, 0.9%. It started in 2010 at $588 per acre. These 1,200 farms increased to $755 an acre in 13 and then ended up at $639 in 19. Corn input costs have gone down five years when they had those losses until 19 when they actually broke even or made a little money. Input costs for beans have increased 0.7% a year for the last 10. Shows you the, the starting point, the high and the, where we were in 19. They've gone down four times in the last 10 years. So here's a budget for 2021 corn and beans. Again, I have those average numbers we used in our budget earlier with the prices. I've increased the farm bill, all the government programs, $15. We used $6 in those budgets, but maybe it'll be a minute. I can't say what's going to be right now. You see the input cost we're talking about. We have $4 in here for the farmer for his, his income and labor. You see total cost breaker is 570 on corn and 337 on soybeans. That leaves above the income above at 110 for, for corn and for 146 for soybeans for pay for rent. Put those two together, you get $256 divided by two, what's your rent? $128 an acre, well below uh, the current rate, rental rates. In, but this is an economics where it looks like today for a budget for 2021. So here's another source of data for rents. The USDA or the National Existing Service, you click on the, their website, which we've got here for you today, um, and they put publications in Minnesota, you'll find this table. This shows you where rents have been since 16 through 21 and 20. You see they, they were start at 170, they decreased to 166, went back to 167, and for the last two years they've been 164. So no change over the last 19 and 20. You see irrigated grounds dropped a little, or changed a little more, it went from 185 to 192 to 205, and it dropped back to 188. So a big drop in irrigated ground by the survey in 2020. But our, our non-irrigated ground is probably similar to the overall average and it went to 163 twice in 2019 and 2020. We have pasture ground. It's been around $3 an acre, but it's dropped now the last two years from 28 to 24 in 2020. If you want to know your county numbers, again, you can go to that National Statistic Service website, nass.usda.gov. You can find this table under publications. So it's, I've got the whole state here in, in two slides. So this is the first part, part of the state. And here we're going to go down here and look at your uh, McLeod County. So they're saying the rents in McLeod, the first column is 19, the second column is 20, went down $1 an acre from the USDA survey. This is 19 figure 203 and the 20 figure is 202. It didn't change much. They didn't publish pasture rents for your county. So if that case, I might use the whole region. And so the whole region, they said they went from $24 to $20 average. But you see different counties are listed there. And for the cropland, they said on the whole region, they went up $9 an acre. But you see McLeod County went down to $1 an acre. So it's just another source of data to look at trends for both pasture and cropland. Land values. What do you think the trend is for land values? Are land values going up? Yes or no? Are they going down? Yes or no? Are they staying the same? Again, I get calls from landlords all the time. I've had landlords that have land in three states, had one that had land in five states. So they might answer this question differently by the, the economics of different states. So just think about what you think the trends are in land values. Here's the USDA number from Minnesota from 2011 to 2020. The blue bar, solid blue bar is the cropland sales or the values. The checkered white striped, the striped white and dark blue hole is the pasture land values and the light blue bars are the farm real estate values. Those are the assessed values of the farms. So you see the trend in croplands, they started well at a low number here in 2011. They increased to this high here in 2014 and they've kind of hovered within that pretty close since then, they've gone down a little bit. 
You see passion values, they gradually increased drive around, but they've been pretty constant. And you see assessed values are following the blue bars pretty good, the solid blue bars. And your county assessors are required to keep your assessed values in 95% of the market values. So they're doing a pretty good job. Those two lines are following each other pretty closely, aren't they? But it gives some trends. So those numbers show you on the bar on the left what the prices are, but this shows you a little better what those prices are. So in 2016, the average cropland sale in Minnesota was 48.40. This is the whole state average. Increased to 49.20, 49.50, then went down to 48.10, and went down to 400 in 2020. So a slight decline in real estate values from 19 to 20. If you had pasture land, you see a trend there, they increased the claim them a little bit too until from 19 to 20. And assessed values, you can see how they vary through the years, but you can see how close they followed the real estate or the sale prices. So there's only $40 difference in 2020. So how do you determine a fair rental rate? What is it? How you, are, you, are we still confused? Are we helped you at all with some ideas? Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Amber and she's gonna walk you through the worksheets that might help you further analyze the process. Thanks, Dave. So we got a quick question in the chat. Uh, for folks that are following along, we are not counting the cover page on page uh, 10, which is the landowner's cash rent worksheet. We had some questions about are those tables um, in the handout? Um, and some of them that Dave went through aren't, but we will go through tables about land rent values in a couple of slides. So great question. Those tables are available. Those slides that from the USDA are, are found at the, on our website. And that if you go to the USDA or NAS, nass.usda.gov and select Minnesota, and under publications, you'll find those tables I just showed you. So it is online. It just didn't show you in the handout. Okay. Sorry. No. Okay. So we're going to hop in and talk about our land rent worksheets. You can find this also on our managing farm page too. You can print it out. You can do it online. Um, the first worksheet we're going to talk through is for our landlords um, to be able to figure out what is uh, their desired rent per acre. Next slide, please. So we just have an example here that I'm going to go through. Um, but this is, you can actually plug in the numbers for your own farm to figure out what would be appropriate. So first thing you want to put in the number of tillable acres that you have here. Um, you know, if you're not renting out all of those acres, I would just put in the number of acres that you're renting out. And then what's the value per acre? Here we have uh, $6,500. Later on, we'll show you what farm sales looked like for McLeod County. They were about $5,000 in 2019 on average, just a little higher than that. Um, so you can put in the appropriate number for value per acre. Here we're going to go with the $6,500. So when we multiply the number of acres that we have by the land value, uh, we have just over a million dollars in assets there, right? So if you decided, don't want to rent it out, I just want to sell my farmland and be done, you could have a million dollars available to you. Now there's a lot that you could do with a million dollars. You could choose to invest it in the stock market. You could choose to take it and go on a very long, fun vacation. You could apply it to retirement. Um, so when we're thinking about this total farm value, we need to know what's your desired return on investment, because that is an asset that you have lots of options of what you could do with it. So in this case, we're saying that we want a desired return of 2.5%, right? So out of that million dollars, we want 2.5% return. So that gives us just over $25,000. We also need to calculate what are our real estate taxes. Real estate taxes can look different across the state, depending on where you live, depending on if you have higher or lower school board taxes. A lot of things can factor into that. Here we've said $50 per acre in taxes is what we're going to figure in. And then liability insurance. That is something that you should consider if you're renting out um, your farmland. Uh, might be a good asset to have. So here we're factoring in $200 for liability insurance. Um, sometimes if you already have insurance on your house, you can work to include um, this under your existing insurance policies. If you have uh, acres that you're renting out, 
And then other cash costs. This could be repairs. This could be if you need electricity because you have a building out there. Um, and you can figure that out. In this case, we have zero dollars in this example because more than likely this landowner is putting those costs, those repair costs, those maintenance costs onto the tenant as part of their agreement. So you can figure that out when you're doing um, your personal agreement. So we wanna figure out what is our total desired return. For this landowner, their total desired return is the return on investment, uh, real estate taxes, liability insurance, and any other costs that they might have. So when we add those all together, it's over $33,000. And then we're gonna divide by the total number of acres. So $33,000, 350 divided by the 156 acres we're going to rent out, that gives the landowner a desired rent of $213 per acre. And we'll show you, next slide, another example here with some other numbers. Um, you know, for this landowner, they have 140 acres that they want to rent out, and their land value is a little lower. Maybe it's not prime farmland, maybe they're in a different spot in the state where it can be a little lower. So they have just about half a million dollars in total farm value. Um, again, they're going to figure out what their desired return on investment is, 2.5%. I mean, I've seen here people put in all the way from 1% to 5% uh, in that range. You know, maybe you're renting out to a grandchild or a child, and so you give them a better break and you rent it to them at 2%, uh, maybe you feel that 3% is the appropriate return. Um, so they're gonna add together that desired return on investment, those real estate taxes, liability insurance, and any other costs or repairs that they might have to get their total desired return. For this example, it's about $16,150. Then they're gonna divide that by the total number of acres that they're renting. So for this farmer, their to or for this landowner, excuse me, their total desired return would be $115 per acre. Um, so this is just a worksheet that you can use to help figure out on the landowner's end, you know, what is your desired return per acre? Next slide. Now we're gonna talk through on the tenant side to help tenants figure out, you know, what do you have available to pay for rent? Um, next slide. So here we've seen a lot of these in budgets already, so we'll go through them pretty quickly. This example, they're a 200 acre farm, they're 50-50 corn, soybean, you can put in the numbers for your farms. So they have a total tillable acres of 200. And then for government payments here, they're trying to figure out how much expected payments uh, will they get on their corn and soybean acres. Like we saw in that expected 2021 budget, it was $8 per acre, so that's what we're using in this example. So they're expecting government payments of $8 per acre for corn and soybeans, uh, which would give them a total expected payment of $1,600. And then they don't think that they're gonna get any other additional income. Next slide. Here we're gonna figure out, you know, what is their crop budget? What do they expect for income? So we're gonna take that corn yields times the expected corn price uh, which in this case is 190 bushels times $3.50 to get a total income of 665. You can do the same thing with soybeans. Uh, we saw this in our previous budget example. Next slide. Then we're going to figure out what are our total direct expenses. So take those seed, fertilizer, chemical expenses, crop insurance, machine release, uh, crop marketing expenses, we're gonna add all of those together to get our total direct expense. For our corn example, that's $449. Next slide. And then if you're following along, you can put in your um, personal farms numbers as you're going through. Here we're trying to figure out what is that total overhead expense. So they're adding together the expense for utilities, for farm insurance, for interest, um, for non-cash depreciation, and getting a total overhead expense of $121. And when we add our overhead and our direct expense, in this case, they're getting $570. And in that net return, we've already seen this in previous budgets. You're gonna take what you expect for that total income, you're gonna subtract that total expense, and that gives us for corn a net return of $95.
and for soybeans in this example, a net return of $131. Next slide. Now this is where things look a little different than we've seen previously. And I'll walk you through this. So what they're trying to do here is to figure out what their total return is going to be. And then knowing that and knowing how many acres we have, that will tell us what we have left over for rent per acre. So in order to calculate that total return, we're gonna to need to figure out what was our total crop return. So we said for corn that we had a net return of $95 per acre times 100 acres, that's where we're getting this 9,500 uh, in total corn return. For soybeans, we had a net return of $131. Multiply that by that 100 acres, gives us $13,000 in return. We also had already found that we had government payments expected of $1,600 and no additional payments. So we add up all of those returns, we get a total return of $24,200. And when we divide that by the 200 acres we have, we see that we have available for rent $121. So that gives you two different points to think about. So from the farmer's end, we have $121 available for rent. And then we saw in that previous example um, with the land tenant what they wanted for desired rent. So hopefully both parties will be able to come to a number that's mutually beneficial. I just wanna note one thing, if you're following through in the handout, you'll see that there are some asterisks on the bottom of your screen. What these are telling us is these are just showing that this number can vary greatly when you're doing these budgets based on um, how you change those numbers. So if we had, instead of $8 per acre for government payments, if we expected zero, our land rent, our money available for rent would go down to $113. We had $65 in government payments per acre, it would go up to over 178. So just some things to note uh, there. Next slide. So here's a few slides on the prices. Um, uh, you see this is the current markets. I did this morning. This is shows that the left column shows the December 20 corn contract, the high low and the change this morning. Um, you can see the prior settle was $4.17 last Friday. And you see New Year bid, next year's bid is four ten, so we go down about seven cents between now and next year's price. You see the carry in the market is only seven cents from December to July which is really a small carry. So again, it shows you where the markets are and they go below $4 in the future. And if you use a 50, 60 cent basis, you can see how we're close to that 350 price going forward next year, right, right there. Here's soybean price. Here's December corn, 2020, uh, or January soybeans. November's gone. So this is January month they're using on the futures is $11.63. And you saw the basis for next year, was like 90 cents. So the futures drop off significantly, like 35 cents between the current price and next year's $1.35. So that's a big difference um, going forward and it gets worse farther out. I think we have a question up there maybe. Let's see. We have a comment here. Can you explain the difference or highlight the difference between Chicago Board of Trade and local market with basis? So earlier I showed you those slides on the local prices and it shows these, these prior settles, these are the futures prices right here. And if I, I could pull it up, I go back, but it's quite a few slides ago, but I showed you the current price. It had those prices minus the basis, gave you the cash price. So our cash price today was 10 something in Hutchinson because they were figuring on a 60 some cent basis. I'll tell you this, I took the, let's say 65 cents off of this price at the futures price, minus 65 cents would give you a cash price of $10.98. Going forward, I know it was 90 cents off this price for the new crop bid. So when we look at that 2021 bid for cash at the elevator in Hutchinson, you take 90 cents off the futures price, that's a basis. So 90 cents off of that would turn into a price of $9.38. That's how all that futures and basis work, okay? So futures is a price out there on the contract month and that basis is what the difference between the futures price and what local prices are paying. And most time it's a negative basis in Minnesota and 
most time 50, 60 cents for corn and 70 to 90 cents for soybeans around the state would be a basis looking forward to next year's prices, just to give you an idea. So you take that number off the futures and, but I showed a local price and they, that they showed both the futures and the basis and then it would cash price right now. So it was all showing that on the bid sheet. This is another way of looking at those numbers. Um, this shows you the December 2020 corn price. And I just try to show you this. Here's, here's where we started the year back here at $4, just about futures, which would be about 350 cash. We declined all the way through to May at a little rally. Then July, we, we dropped off. So here's July, one, two, this weekly chart, three, that's the end of July. Here's the first weeks in August. We were down here at the $320 mark for futures. We rallied above 420, which we got a dollar rally in the corn market, but it all started after the second week of August. We've had a nice, strong market, and we're at new highs up here. We were. Now we dropped, we went to a high of 430, we dropped off a little bit, 15 cents where we are right now. But again, um, a lot of farmers hadn't seen, were, were sad during this time. We were out up a little again, they might have sold right in here where the high price was like 360. In my 50 cents, they would have got 310 for a high price. But a lot of corn was sold, um, maybe that price in the $3 range. So what's the average? It's kind of hard to say for everybody. Just to show you, here's next year's 2021, similar pattern. Again, the second week of August, it started rallying up, and we went from 360 up to over 412 or 415, almost 460. Okay. Here's the soybean chart. So November's gone, but soybeans are at new territory here. This is the January 21 futures contract. You see back here, May, second week of August again, it was right here, and it started rallying up. So beans went from like 870 to $12. So that's a big rally. Um, in the bean market, but again, it happened kind of late in the year. Normally, this would not happen. This is like a spring rally. Usually, what that happens in Sorkley, and normally in the, in the harvest time, it goes like this down. So, we've had the opposite kind of market this year. And here's 21 soybeans. You see their record highs there as well. And they did rally up, but again, it started, they, they rallied a little bit earlier, more steady back here in May. They started going up gradually with soybeans. So, what do you think the farmer's break-even price will be for 2021 corn? Um, Amber shows you some lots of budgets, and we kind of come to the numbers at the bottom. And the questions are out that. But what do you think the farmers in general is going to be for a break-even price for corn and soybeans? Just write that comment down and fill in those blanks. So if after filling those blanks in, Amber's going to walk you through a worksheet that'll help you figure out what that price might be. Great. Okay, next slide. So we'd already talked about this previously in the budgets, but here we're gonna show you how to do it for your farm, uh, for your own farm numbers. Uh, I know that uh, Dave had mentioned that some of you might have uh, sugar beets as well. If you do, you can do this worksheet for more than just um, corn and soybeans. Just add in another column for that additional commodity that you have. So we'll just quickly go through this here. Corn I would make your comment. There, there are small grain budgets from Minnesota and there are sugar beet budgets from Minnesota on our webpage, on the team webpage. So you can go look there as well for those budgets. Perfect. So we're going to go through this quickly. We've seen most of this and then we'll go in more depth on the parts that we haven't seen. Crop income budget. Here we're trying to tell, calculate what's your total income per acre. So first of all, put down what are your corn acres. In this example that we're going through, they're a thousand acre farm with a 50% corn and 50% soybeans. Um, so total income per acre, they're taking that yield, multiplying it by the expected price, and then adding any government payments. So for corn, we're looking at about $695, for soybeans, 498. Next slide. Then we're gonna calculate our direct expense per acre. We have seen this budget, I think two, three times now. Um, so you're going to add up what all those crop expenses are to get your direct expense per acre. For corn, in this example, it's 652. Next slide. And in this case, uh, just to note with the last one, we are including land rent. Um, and then lastly here, we're going to figure out what our overhead expenses per acre are. So we're going to add up all those overhead expenses and get uh, $92 in this example for corn and figure out what our total expense per acre is. So that's our direct expense, including land rent, plus our overhead expense. 
So once we know what our total expense per acre is, this is where this price uh, budget looks a little different. So we're gonna take that total expense per acre and multiply it by the numbers of acres that we have. So in this case, we have a total expense of $744 for corn per acre times 500 acres. That's where we're getting this $372,000 in total corn expense. We do the same thing with soybeans. So that $509 expense per acre, multiply it by 500 acres of soybeans to get just over 2,500, uh, two, wow, excuse me, $254,000 in expenses. Next slide. Okay, this might look a, a little interesting, but what we're trying to do here is gauge what our living expenses are, right? So to know that break-even price, we have to know what our total expense is in order to cover that expense. So here you're gonna to wanna to put in your family living expense and figure out what proportion of that comes from our row crops to get this living expense allocated to row crops. So in this case, this family has about $85,000 in family living expense. I really wanna stress here that it's important to put in a realistic family living expense number. Uh, most people, myself included, are notoriously bad at estimating what our family living expense is. And often we estimate under what our actual living expense is. So we wanna be putting in uh, as close to an accurate number as we can so that we don't have to reduce our lifestyle. Um, so just a note with this as well, you know, if both of you are working full-time on the farm and you're a 100% uh, corn and soybean operation, this portion of income derived from row crops for you might be 100%. Um, also, if you're both working on the farm, something to think about in making sure that you include in this family living expense is health insurance. You know, that's part of your expenses as well. So here for this farm, they, with $85,000 at 60%, their living expense allocated to row crops is $51,000. So if we divide that by 1,000 acres, that means that their family living cost per acre is $51. And just a note on average in Minnesota, that family living cost per acre is about $60 to $70. Next slide. So now we're gonna be able to figure out what is our acceptable price. So the first thing you wanna do is put in your crop expense. We already calculated that up above. Then put in your family living expense. In this example, even though we said it was $51,000, Half of that goes to corn, half of that goes to soybeans. Put in any expected payments that you might have. So earlier in that income section, we saw that they're expecting $30 in government payments per acre. So $30 times 500 acres, that's where they're getting this $15,000 from. And then figure out what your net expense is. So add together the expense for that commodity add together that family living expense and subtract any additional payments, those government payments. So for corn, in this case, we have about $382,500 in net expenses that we need to cover. Um, and so what is that price that we can get to cover those expenses? Well, we have, we're expecting 190 bushels per acre. We have 500 acres. So that gives us for corn a total of 95 thousand bushels. So if we divide our net expense by the total amount of bushels that we're expecting to produce, that gives us a price of four dollars and three cents. So in this example farm, in order to cover all of their expenses, they need to get a price of at least four dollars and three cents for corn and ten dollars and nineteen cents for soybeans. So if you're thinking back to the last time that we talked about this, this is pretty close to those numbers that we showed in the projected uh, 2021 budgets, uh, where we said, I believe, four dollars and ten cents for corn, and ten dollars, yes, ten dollars and twenty cents for soybeans. So you can plug in your own farm's numbers to figure out what's your break-even price that you need to get. Next slide. All right. Thanks, Amber. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, farm and rental rate trends. So again, we're, we're going to give this information. Uh, online, there's a state map on our website. You can go look at things online to look at how you click on the rental rates in your area. 
Um, we've got a couple sources of data here for you. The Minnesota Egg Statistics Service, that NAS data, NASS website right here. You click on, you go to that website, you select Minnesota, and then you, you'll find information on rental rates and a lot of stuff we share today. Um, you'll find this regional numbers, which is kind of interesting to find, like we're in central Minnesota. They're saying regionally it went down uh, $9 an acre in the region. Pasture ground went down $4 an acre from 19 to 20. Um, but overall the state, it didn't change for cropland. Pasture ground went down uh, $4, $4 an acre. And irrigated ground declined quite a bit from that 215 to 100, the 188. So, um, but you see for the last six years, we've had four years out of the last six have been declines and two years of really no change. So that's kind of the trend right now, flat to uh, somewhat declining rates after many years of increases. So now we're, we're back to your handout and you'll find these tables um, on, on page 13 and 14. And we're looking at Meeker County, which is central Minnesota in the bottom, page, bottom section on page 13, your handout. And so what we've got here, so I'm gonna go across the line from 2011 to 2019, those are the average rents in Meeker County from farmers who are part of the, or McLeod County, I'm sorry, McLeod County and the farmers who are the Gulf Farm Management Program. So the high was actually back here in 2013 at 238, declined a little bit to 14 and then it's been declined, but it went up again in 17, up a little 18 and then down in 19. So that's, these numbers show you where they, where they have been. If you, if you want to see these two bold numbers, I estimated rents for those figures and I didn't do it for 19, but I can, I, but those bold mean basically that I took the other county data and they estimated it for the previous year by the change in the other counties. Sherburne had no starting point, so I couldn't do that with Sherburne. But if I had a starting point, I could do that. So through the, from 11 to 19 is from the Gulf Farm Management Program, FEMA database. Then you see in bold, it says USDA for 2019 and 2020. Those are by the surveys, I just showed you those across the state. So again, the uh, McLeod County was 203 and, and 201. And you can see the, uh, that's just the trend rates for those. So it went down $1 an acre in McLeod County, it went down $6 an acre in Meeker County. And I showed you regional numbers on the previous slide. And you see an estimate 2021. This is just a get I guideline or estimate. I don't know what's going to do in 2021, but I, like I told you, I follow the trends. And the trends say flat to uh, somewhat, somewhat down. So here you see I put this at 30. Um, this one down, look at the big difference here. Wright County had a big discrepancy. So they're showing. It dropped off dramatically in 2019 in Delphi Management Program. So I used a lower number, 165. But in general, I went with the, the USDA number flat unless there was a big discrepancy between the two. Like here, there was a big difference of $24 an acre difference. So I kind of went in between there and estimated. But these are just estimates. Doesn't mean that's a gospel. Um, this was higher, so I put that a little higher than the FINMA data. But I know these are actual numbers off farmers' records. And I know these are estimates from surveys. So. I'm always thinking these are a little more reliable because they're actually off their records, which we use for taxes and extension. So again, but this is just a guideline. Do your own figuring. If you want just a trend for figuring your rents, um, basically the trend right now is zero change, but that's what we're gonna use. This slide is not in your handout, it's not online. I just put it here just to try to show you how closely the corn and soybean prices control rents. So what we have here is the calendar year, 2000, 2019. And then this column is the actual price the farmers got for their corn and beans from 2000 to 2019. So you see the price changed. We had some really high years in there. And then we we're, were kind of in the low end and started really low. Okay. This column is, takes the average price of corn and soybeans, how they changed each year. So starting in 2000 for our benchmark year, from 2000 to 2001, the corn and soybean price, even though the corn went up a penny, beans went down enough that the change was an average of a negative 3.21%. And that's how every year it lists that change. Over here, these are the average rents in Southern Minnesota each year for those 1,200 farms. You see how that, I'm going to tell you, I told you earlier, rents are slowly go up in the good, when the prices are increasing, and they're slow to go down when the prices are decreasing. So that's what the actual rental rates each year average. This column takes the previous year rent times the price change next year and gets a forecasted rent. So it takes that $98 times negative three and gets that for a forecasted rent. It takes previous year rent, 97 times the increased price to get that for forecasted rent. It takes previous year rent times the price every year. These take the previous year rents times the price change to get a forecasted rents. So if, if the rents correlated directly like the question was earlier when the price was not the same for corn, corn on right now what it should be, what we need to be, this one, if the rents acted directly to the price of corn and bean average, these never be identical. 
but they're not identical. They, because the corn price does, and bean prices swing dramatically. You see a 48%, 22% recline, 47% increase, 50% increase. So in three years, the price has doubled and went up again, went down. So a lot of volatility in the corn and bean prices. So that shows up in these prices every year because the price is going up and down dramatically. So some years the forecast rent's lower, some years it's higher. And some years it's well, well lower and some years it's well higher. So again, but if they really do follow each other, if I add up all these rents forecasted by the price change and the way the rents actually were, as they slow to go up in the good times and slow down the poor times, total them up and divide by the number of years, how close do you think the average would be between these two year columns? Would it be $30 difference, 15, 20? What do you think the difference would be? The actual difference is less than $1 per acre in rent. So over time, even though they're more volatile because they react, they don't re, don't react exactly to the corn and soybean corn and soybean price changes. They do follow each other over the, over that time period. So it's really interesting to how corn and soybean prices do really affect the rental rates in Minnesota. The last column is what I call these are coffee shop rates. Instead of instead of adjusting back to the real rents every year, it starts this benchmark at ninety eight dollars, takes the price change, gets that for a forecasted rent, and takes that forecasted rent. And every year it takes a time the price change, so it adjusts more differently than this, this column. So you can see it's much more rapid increases, it follows those price changes more dramatically. So when we had the higher prices, some of those coffee shop rates truly did follow the corn soybean prices changes. Three, three years above $300. And then we had decline rents until this year, it shows an increase again. So if it if really did follow the corn soybean prices, you know, I use 203, which is pretty or 205 for those budgets, but 213 might be the number. But how close is this number? That landlord worksheet, remember that first example we worked through and Amber walked through? It was $213 an acre was that landlord worksheet. So again, it's kind of interesting how these all work out compare. So just some numbers to think about. Land values. I have two sources of data for you in your handout today and online. First the USDA and then land economics. Before we get there, yields are a big factor in calculating break-evens. So what do you think your farm corn yield and your farm's soybean yield is? And I'm gonna say, what is your APH? APH is actual production history for your farm. Um, when we talked about the 52 bushels and 990 bushel corn and 50 bushels soybeans, those are the five year APHs for those 1200 farms. So what's your farm's five year APH? Just to, if you don't know it, just ask them what you think it is for the last five years on your farm. In your handout again, I have tables and numbers, several pages. So we are in central Minnesota, which starts in, on, no, it starts, let's see. It's on the bottom of page 15. So <clears throat> if you see all these counties, so I'm gonna go down to the McLeod County line. These numbers come from the USDA each year, they're released in February and National Statistics Service. So they published these in February and those are the same yields that are used for the farm bill payments. So in the actual yield in, for, for the county of McLeod average was 189 in 2019, 183 in 2018, 206 and 17 and so on. And so there's your five year average, 192. Here's the corn yields, 19 through 15. There's the five year average, 51. So when I use 190 and 50 bushel, 50 bushel beans in my budgets, they're darn close to McLeod County averages, aren't they? If you uh, look at your situation, if your farm yields were 260, well, you have probably above average farm. If your yields were 180 and 45, maybe you have a below average farm and maybe your rent should be corresponding from the averages too. So just another way of thinking about it and try to find out what your five year yields were, okay? Compared to these county averages. So again, I asked you earlier, but what do you think they are? But now I just wanna pick one of the three. What do you think the trends are for land values? Are land values going up? Are they going down or are they remaining the same? What do you think? Well, this chart's online. This exact page is online. Shows you the trends in Southwest Minnesota for, for 14 counties. My predecessor started doing these in the 1990s. He started with six, went to seven. I doubled to 14 when I took over. And it's been consistently the same data from the county assessors. I'm doing it right now for 2020. Every year we send off a letter to the assessor saying, please give us the first six months of data each calendar year to for bare, bare dirt sales, no improvements. It's gotta be non-related parties. So I don't want family transactions. It's gotta be more than 20 acres. I don't want building sites, which oftentimes go for a higher price. And it's gotta be more than half tillable of the acres I want cropland. So we, we throw out everything else. And this is bare dirt sales listed here. And you can see the trends. 
We don't get up your far as you do, you know, towards, far north we get is Chippewa County and Yellow Medicine, uh, Lac La Parla kind of northern end. So let's just look at Chippewa here. So there's the county average sale prices for black dirt, how it changed for the year, and there's the average for 2019. The highest one on here is Brock County, which average sales in 2013 were 11,000 an acre. But if you compare 18 to 19 here, the highlighted sales are the ones that went up. The non-highlighted went down. So you see half the sales, seven counties went up in 2019 from 18, and half of them went down. That average shows up here, went down $13 an acre on average. You had some years of big increases percentage-wise and big dollar amounts. We had four years of declines, it increased in 18, and then went down about stayed the same in 2019. <clears throat> when Amber went through the landlord worksheet, we used $65 an acre. You can see that's kind of where that number's been for the last couple of years, a little bit above it, but $65 is a good value for 2019 sale prices. And again, you can find this same table online. I'll get 2020 on there. I'll get that updated when I get those done. I've got half the counties in so far. I'm still waiting for the other half. Another website you can go to is on the top of this table. It's two pages worth in your handout. It's called landeconomics.umn.edu. Um, Steve Taff used to do this, and then Bill Adams was doing it the last couple of years. It's a great source of data. You can, you, they collect the data from the assessors again by calendar year, but it goes through September 30th of each year. So 2020 will come through next year through September this year and be online by March of next year sometime. You can go to the same website and find 2020 sales. But right now it's got 2019 sales. So in 2019, there were 12 sales in McClellan County of ag property. That was the average sale price of those ag properties, 51 and 83. That was the low sale price and that was the high sale price. And that was the average in 2018. So they were saying the average went down by almost $550 an acre from to 19. But some counties went way up, some counties went way down. Up, we got down, we got down, we've got, we've got down, we've got down, we've got up, we got up, we got up, we got up, and up, and up. We do the whole state. The change from 18 to 19 was kind of like my, my numbers locally. They were, they were kind of flat. So, but they do vary quite a bit by county. So you can see there's some big numbers in here. You get Scott County and Metro County, Stearns County, some big numbers in there because to get some metro areas for Carver County too, where you get some metro county where you gotta pay the premium because those farmland gets close to development issues. But you can go to this website, I encourage you to do the after workshop and you can find what I like about this website, all 12 these sales by township. So if you wanna find what land is selling for by in your neck of the woods, you go to this, this uh, website, Land Economics, choose farmland sales and click the cloud county and you can see county sa all sales by township since 1990. So it's a great source of data to track the trends in land values in your area. Flexible rental agreements. Take a little bit of time here to talk about flexible rental agreements. I've been encouraging them for a lot of years. There's lots of ways to do them. You can do them based on gross revenue. You can do a base rent plus a bonus. Do yield only on price only or profit sharing. The most common, basically simplest one is yield only or just take the a basic bushels amount and then, then gross is the second most popular. This table is on page 19 in your hand. I think it's very informative too. We've got the years 1995 to 2019. This is the average rents paid by those 1,200 farms. You can see in 2012, we were still under $200 an acre. And there was the high in 2013, and now we're back to 208. You can see over here is the price of the farmers got, the 1,200 farms for corn and soybeans. I have two more columns I couldn't put on the handout. That was the average yields each year. You take the average yields and the average prices, and you get these two columns. That's the gross revenue from corn and soybeans takes the, the rent divided by the, the total revenue and you have these two numbers, percent of gross. That's a very simple form of flexible lease. So <clears throat> I could tell you, you can do it based on actual yields or you can do it based on APH, the actual participation for your farm. If you do the APH, you kind of already know what you're gonna get for bushels and the only variable is price because you're gonna take those APH bushels times these percent of gross and then the only variable is price. And so the variable might take that price once a year, twice a year, spring and fall, maybe take the crop insurance numbers, maybe take it quarterly, maybe take it monthly, average it out times the actual yield or times the APH historic yield, and then you can figure out your rent. So again, shows you how it varies as prices go up or go down. When the prices go up, the APH, the percent of gross goes down. When the prices go down, the percent of APH goes up. So. Anyway, the last 10 years, it's been 29 and 40%. Let's look at some examples. So using those examples, we've got 180 bushel corn at 350. At 29%, that's the rent of 192. 
the price actually averages out to $4, that's 220. The rent averages out to 450, that's about 248. So none of these examples go down, and we're gonna assume that if the price goes down, um, we're gonna have a floor for the landlord. We're gonna put a base rent in there. So if the price really goes down dramatically, or the yield, the landlord's gonna guarantee a, a base rent because the farmer has crop insurance. So the, if the price for yield goes down to a certain level, they're gonna start getting crop insurance money. The landlord doesn't have any guarantee for the floor unless they put a base rent in. So that's why I didn't put prices lower. So here's a mean example, 52 bushels at $9 at 40%, that's the rent. At $10, there's the rent. $11, there's the rent. So you take the average of those two and you'd have your average rent. But a very simple way of doing a flexible lease. You can do a percent of net. It's a little more complicated. It doesn't work as well last, because it's based on current prices. But for the last 10 years, especially on soybeans, about a third of the net goes to the farmer and two thirds of the net goes to the landlord. The corn budget indicates an net uh, income of $665 at Amber Walk Group 2021. Expenses before rent and labor were only $530. So net on corn is $135 an acre. That's a profit shared between the landlord and the farmer. 190 bushels at 350. So take two thirds of that going to the landlord, that's $98. The balance goes to the farmer for rent or for income. With soybeans, here's the income projected for 21. Here's the expenses without labor or rent. And that's $171 an acre. So two thirds of that go to 113. So again, not very good rental rates for, for either one. and doesn't work well for 21 using that percent of profits. Here's where I got those numbers from. Here shows you, basically look at the last five lines. You've got net income for the farmer, and actually the last six lines. Labor charge, net income equals the farmer's share. And then the rest, so those two of the, that's all the income come off the corn being corn ground each year, and how much each party's getting, the landlord and the farmer. And you go over here because we had five years from 2014 to 2018 of losses for the farmer, the rent was actually higher than the net income off the land. So that's why they get more than 100% and why there's losses over here for the farmer. So that made these skew, skewed much lower on corn and soybeans for the last 10 years because of, uh, of those losses for the last five. But the soybean budget looks more, more common. You see we've got last 10 years, it was about one third, two thirds, and it was even a little closer for the last, from 2006, 2019, close to that one third, two thirds. And soybeans, unlike corn, lost 22 cents one year. So not, not very big, almost all profits for soybeans for the farmer. This is a really simple agreement, a flexible rent based on bushels. Again, you, you can use the APH, take a third of those bushels, so 190 bushels is 63 bushels, and 52 bushels and a third is 17 bushels, and round it up to even number. So that's the bushels we're gonna take, the only variable is price. So on once a year, twice a year, spring and fall, four times, a, once a quarter, whatever, take the average of those prices, and we're gonna assume it's 350 and $9, that'd be $221 an acre rent for corn, 153 for soybeans, an average of 197. If you want to talk about sugar beets, um, if you look at Finbin data from Minnesota, uh, the sugar beet budgets compared to the corn and soybean budgets, the rent premium is about seven, or if, I'm sorry, five to six percent increase for sugar beet ground the year it's planted sugar beets over the corn and soybeans. So just to give you an idea of what that would be an increase over that. But here's just a corn and soybean budget to give you some examples of bushels per year. On, on your handout on page 21, you'll see all these different uh, uh, lease agreements based on these different tools. They all use a 350 corn price in the fall and $9 corn price or soybean price in the fall and are going to get our actual APHs. So the first example takes a third of the crop on December 15th. That's the one-time price where the price was that day coming up here, you know, in a week and a little over a week. The price is going to be $3.50 and $9. So a third of the crop, you get 221 for corn and 156 for soybeans. And that one I didn't take. I took exactly the percentages. So that gets 188. I've got a base uh, rent of 150, that's the floor. So that's what the landlord's gonna count on for sure. And he's gonna get a bonus of $38.50. Here's a base rent plus a bonus. So this base rent's based on a third of the APA. And if you wanna figure out what that base rent might be, take a, a 25 to 30% of the typical yield history, the APH, and figure out what that would be. And then 30%, the base is 199.50 for corn and 140.40 for soybeans. That average is 170 roughly for a base rent. Then I got a bonus example here following through the example and the bonus average is $13. So there's the, the rent based on base rent plus the bonus. Here's one based on yield only. It's got different, different components here. You got lower base yields. And then that, because of that lower base rent of 133, and then the actual yields are computed with these bonuses and different prices. So you can set that up it's a little more complicated. And then we have one based on price only. Just set those set bushels of 13, 63 bushels on corn, 70 bushels on soybeans and the prices 
and we get the average rent of 186.75. On page 22, I've got some lease forms, just simple lease forms, they're written out. So there's two lease forms on that page. The top one is one form, and the bottom half of the second form. And just fill, there's simple forms here, because it's always good to have something in writing, so you can prove that what you're talked about. So I got your name, your total acres, your percent of growth as an example. And I've got four dates at local elevator. January 15th next year, March 15th, June 15th, September 15th. I'm gonna check the elevator prices for 21 corn and beans. And we're gonna round, average them out, take them times our APH percent, or else take them times the actual yields. Use HPH by September 15th. I can know what my, my lease is gonna rent for gonna be a year. But again, fill in the blanks, take those four dates and average them out. So like I said earlier, rents historically have been about a third on corn and about 40% on soybeans. Or you can set bushels. Again, put a blank bushels brown in there. So the old bushel only variable then is price. I've got four different dates here. So I know the bushels I'm gonna have based on rent on and by October 15th, I know the average of those four prices. I take the time those bushels we have in here and I'm gonna know my rent. Again, 60 to 70 bushels on per acre on corn and 17 to 22 bushels per beans. Landlords, um, you can get a first lien on a crop. If you, but most landlords, more and more lease agreements are cash up front now, single payment. If you get that, you've got your money and the farmer has all the risk. You don't need to worry about your, your, the first lien consideration. But if you have a spring and fall payment and you're concerned about getting your fall payment, you can file a lien at the courthouse every year and get a first lien on the crop. So what you do, is within 30 days of the crop starting to grow, you go to the courthouse where your crop is being planted and file a UCC filing. That'll give you a first lien on the crop. You have to do it within 30 days of the crop starting to grow. So I always tell people by probably by Memorial Day, you're going to be fine if you get that crop or they get the UCC filed. But it's going to be an annual fee and that'll get you a, a first lien on the crop. It's a kind of a hassle for the farmer because they'll issue joint checks then for, for the party. So, but again, if you're concerned a lot about your second half payment, you could do this. I'm going to tell you, when we had those losses, the previous five years might have been concerned, but now if 19 farmers got better income and now in 20, they probably even got better income. So their, their conditions are actually probably improving overall. Again, I tell landlords, once you have an agreement written down, put it, or agreed upon, put it down in writing because if you don't have a written lease, it's really hard to prove things. So, and my memory is getting poorer and poorer every year. So if I, we do negotiations, we've already done our negotiations for rents next year, well, my rent doesn't come until May next year. What do I, what do we agree upon back in October or November? My memory gets short. I don't remember what I did yesterday sometimes. So put it down in writing. So you, and better yet, fill out that lease form I just gave you some examples of, sign it, send it to them, have them sign it, send it back to you. You've got a written lease. That'd be a, a good way to do it. If you want some nice formal lease forms, agleese11.org is a place you can go. And there's fill in the blank lease forms here. One for facilities, one for pasture, one for, crop land and one for or cash rent on crops and flexible rent on crops. So they're fillable in the blanks of examples, definitions. It's a great place to go. Um, it's been interesting times last few years. Like I said, we had five years of row of losses on corn. So farmers are deciding whether to keep or give up some land. The first thing they think about is whether they can cover the direct costs. And we can do that on both corn and soybeans and the budgets. And number two, land quality versus rental rates. My nephew farms and he's got land on both sides of one road. The one farm is well tiled and the other farm's not. So in 19, the crops were really different because we had really wet spring and they couldn't get in on the non-well-tiled ones. So there was a big yield difference. There's a big different yield difference this year too, even though it, wasn't as, it was a better year. So they know the comparisons, but the both farms shouldn't get the same rent, but they might be. So they have to decide on that. Again, the financial position of the operation, that farmers are getting better, I think, the last two years. We're looking for other ways to generate some money as well. On the landlord side, looking at the ability to cover your direct costs, your property taxes and your other financial needs. How will you get along with your tenants is really important. Um, my family farms in South Dakota. We've had one farm under the same tenant all my life, the other one since I was junior in high school. And um, on my dad's side, that farmer's farm retiring next year. We just got new tenants uh, next year set up. Also another thing you think about, I get more landlords calling me and they have concern about the agronomic care of the farm. A lot of retired farmers have built a fertility and they wanna maintain that. So they're, they're concerned you can put soil tests required in there to maintain fertility. Um, you can put in there that you want to have covered crops, protect the waterways, all kinds of things you can do, but you have to have at least to do that. You also might want to consider a flexible lease option and if you want to. Negotiation skills are important. We want to win-win for both parties. We want to separate the people from the problem. I get a lot of Lawrence landlords call me and say, darn farm, he goes to, on a vacation to Hawaii every winter. I don't do that. But we're not talking about their lifestyle. We're not talking about their income, how they live. We're talking about negotiating for a land rent. 
Now what question are we getting from? We got past conflicts. Do a checklist. What is what you want? What was they want? We gave you some worksheets to think about. Um, here's another flexible lease. Are you wanting a certain margin? This is a simple lease form, flexible lease. I, I want $100 a year for the till acres in my pocket, plus my property taxes paid. That's a lease form. The flexible part is what? The property taxes. So each year my property tax statements come out. I make a copy of that, give that to the farmer, and he's gonna write me a check for that amount plus $100 an acre for my pocket. So that's, that's a flexible lease agreement. That can go on forever. Maybe it's $75, maybe it's 150, whatever you think is a fair number, that's a margin model, okay? Once I do that, it can go on forever. There's no reason to do it every year if, if I'm happy with that margin. But you could, have, you could have a termination date there every year because um, you might wanna renew that amount. But anyway, long-term agreements work. I've seen flexible leases in place for over 30 years because once you do that flex where it's just below prices and yields, it's good every year. I've seen some of those get renewed because of a, when we had higher prices, the base went up. Now we have lower prices, the base should go down. I've seen 40 year fixed lease between a city and farmers. So there's lots of ways of doing it. Don't think in terms of $250 an acre. I get a lot of people saying, I heard that at the coffee shop, that's the going rate. It may be, it may not be. I know $400 an acre rent in 2020 on this last past year. So that's a coffee shop rate, that's the going rate, right? You heard that? Well, no, it's not. In that scenario, the landlord had pattern tiled the farm in 2019. Okay, spent a lot of money because the farmer didn't, sometimes the farmer do that for the landlords as well, but this case, the landlord paid for the whole works. And the farmer said, well, I'm gonna help you out with those costs. So in 2020, because you're making the land better for me next year, I'm gonna give you $400 an acre rent. One year, but $400 an acre rent next year. So is that because of the economics? No, it's because of what happened, situation. And a lot of variables like that are out there. So again, that may or may not be the right rate which you hear in the coffee shop. Want to invent options for mutual gain for both parties? Um, maybe utilize flexible rental agreements. Maybe add clause to the agreements. You have to have a written lease to do that. Maybe use a margin model like I just talked about. Maybe set up a long-term agreement. What, what is right for you is up to you, figuring that out. We want you to use objective criteria. We gave you the National Statistics Service. They gave you FINMA data. We don't rely on car shops so much because like you said, you don't hear all the details and you don't hear all the rents. You just hear the top end rents to the coffee shop. Preparation is key to good, good negotiations. So we want you to prepare and engage and review. You're doing that by listening to this workshop right now. We want you to encourage your partner to do the same thing. Again, these are being recorded. You can find them online um, later. You can watch them as YouTube. You've got the handout online. And you've got a lot of information on our website. So there's lots of places for, to share with your partners in this negotiation process. Negotiating skills are important. We want to win with both parties. Here's a resource we talked about this morning, uh, Ag Business Management, the Finman Database, the Ag Statistics Service, Farmland Values, and Ag Lease 101.org. I also something called a Farm Resource Guide each year. It's 120 pages. I'm a numbers guy. It's full of charts, data. You can order one. You just send me an email, or this is my landline, or you can call my cell phone. Tell me what version you want. I need your name, address, and phone number. And we'll send you one that usually come out the second week of January around then, and the university will send you an invoice. So again, if you'd like one, just drop me an email or leave me a phone message and we'll get you on the list. So I'm back to this question, what direction is rent going 2021? You start with a number in that first question. How do you feel? Was that the same rent as 2020? Was it going up or was it going down? What do you think should happen now after this, after the workshop? Well, I could make arguments for all three. Should they stay the same? Well, right now the trends say they stay the same because of the trends are one was USDA was going same flat and the Fidman went down 0.4%. Should they go up? Well, usually the economics are getting better in 19 and even better in 20 for most farmers. Again, not every farmer, but for most farmers, and that might mean they should go up a little bit. Should they go down? Well, maybe I had that $4 lease. It surely should go down next year. Um, and maybe I had a long-term lease that was at a higher rate. Maybe that will go down next year. So I could answer yes to all three at least depending on my circumstances. So again, you have to figure out what's right for you and hopefully get through some good negotiations. That's what Amber and I have for you this morning. So we take questions. Again, you can go in the, the chat or the Q&A. When you, when you leave the meeting this morning, we appreciate you taking a little time. An evaluation form will pop up in your, on your computer. Just take a few minutes to answer those questions. Appreciate your feedback for future workshops. Um, we still have a lot more of these coming up the rest of the week. And even the following two weeks, we have workshops like this. So if somebody else wants to attend one, they're, they're kind of centered on location, but they can still follow along and find the information that they're after for wherever their, count, their land is. So again, Amber and I, well, thank you for listening this morning. And we appreciate any, any questions that you might have. And again, your participation in the evaluation. Thank you much. Good luck with your negotiations.